Good evening. Welcome to Wine and Words. I am Sarah Jane Rose, narrator and wine consultant, and I have set this up to bring my two worlds together in perfect balance and share with you my passion for wine and books and stories. And so each week you get, I do these in a little series, and each week I choose a book and a pair of wine with it. We are in the midst of Mystery March and we've been looking at various thrillers and mysteries and pairing a wine and each wine has a sort of tenuous link to crime. So we've been looking at that. If you've missed any of the weeks, you can catch up with them in the group uh, or the videos will be available also on YouTube uh, for a few weeks as well. So what are we looking at this week? This week we are going to be tasting this which is a Hungarian wine called Ferment, which is from the region called Mad in Hungary, uh, which is wonderful. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, plus an extra little story, which is about uh, the sort of legend of, of bull's blood, which is a famous, oh my God, I shouldn't be showing my nails. How terrible is that? Uh, and we're going to be looking at uh, her new best friend, which was the book This Week by Penny Bachelor and I won't be showing you my nails again because I realised I haven't done them. Anyway, so first of all, let's have a little look at the wine. As always, hydration. Um, we'll have a little look at the wine and a bit of a chat about that. If you're joining me in the live and you're drinking something, let me know what you're drinking. Doesn't have to be this one, doesn't have to be Hungarian. Just let me know what you're drinking uh, and what you think about it. Actually, I'm just gonna swill that a little bit randomly. Um, apologies if this is a little bit unstable here today. I think it was last week as well. Let me get rid of that. Um, so ferment you may know about uh, or you may not. So first of all you might not know very much about Hungarian wine at all. There isn't a huge amount of it in the UK but there is some to be found and it is actually jolly jolly good if you've ever been lucky enough to sort of go to Hungary and I've been to Budapest which is lovely and experience the wine kind of there it's really beautifully made and so much of it is elegant and refined and it has this rich incredible rich history with sort of all of the wine making and everything that goes on there and obviously you, you will more than likely have heard of Tokai which is one of the most famous sweet wines in the world really next to Saturn and that's really what Hungary is known for in the UK but actually there's a lot of really good dry white wines and also red wines to be to be found as well. So this is Ferment which is the same grape variety. I apologise again about my nails. You just see look look it's terrible they're like all scratched off. They were pink about a week ago and they're not now. Sorry it don't have time to do my nails. We'll be talking about the uh, trials of motherhood in the book actually um, and um, so, but this is the dry version the dry grape variety though ferment uh, grown in the mad region and if you see this there's quite, there's a few uh, quite a few growers that grow it in that in that area um, and I've never had a bad one so I'd, I'd always recommend it as something a little bit different and a little bit interesting to have a look at and quirky um, now on the nose you get this sort of 
a little bit of sherbet, a bit of sherbet lemon and lovely kind of stone fruits and minerality. And this actually quite tropical on the palate initially. And maybe like some kiwi, it's incredibly complex, like kiwi, tropical flavours, lots of lime coming in there, it's minerality, the acidity is lovely, and almost having this almost sort of salty level to it, which is gorgeous. Um, and again, that length, but it's fully dry, so it's not sweet at all, but incredibly complex with this beautiful dry finish. So if you see this on a wine list somewhere, I highly recommend it. It's probably not going to be the cheapest thing on the wine list, but uh, I think it really does offer you something completely different and, and really interesting. And I don't think we, there isn't a huge amount of Hungarian wines we had in the in the UK, but if you do come across it, then do try it because it, it is it is delicious. I've never had, a, I can't think of any bad Hungarian wine that I've had. So as I say, it's got this really rich history and one of the things that we obviously do associate i think with um hungarian wine is something that we call sort of bull's blood and um this has a sort of quite an interesting story to it uh in that the invaders at the time I've got to find the 1500s i think it was and uh sort of invading hungary and I've forgotten the name of in the massive region of Hungary and this um, this ta the air there's an area called Iga which is a town uh, between sort of uh, Budapest and Tokai and it's, it was this Turkish invasion led by Suleiman the Magnificent uh, in about sort of 1552 and during the invasion, they attempted this uh, siege of the castle. But the defending Hungarians had, um, who were sort of outnumbered, but they had so much of this, this sort of strong wine and big food and they managed to defend it and the and the Turkish army was forced to withdraw. Now the the legend behind this is that they believed that because they'd had this this bull's blood wine, um, that that actually actual bull's blood had been mixed into the wine, and this is what had sort of enhanced the the soldiers. So they they believed that because of this this bull's blood, they couldn't they couldn't defeat these soldiers and there were also claims that not only that they could that they physically couldn't that the the wine with this bull's blood in it had made the soldiers so strong that they literally couldn't stab them so that's that's the story behind it now you can still get uh that today it's actually uh blau frankish is the great variety generally used or kek francos and um and and actually i think it had a sort of bad reputation for being cheap you could get some really good interesting wines again there so there's that kind of fun story of uh this mysterious legend around that so as i say i, I, I urge you to take a look at hungarian wines and uh, because they really are good if you see them and if you see them on an interesting wine list then have a go so coming up to mother's day on sunday and this week we have been reading her new best friend by penny bachelor and which I enjoyed almost seems the wrong word. Um, there were lots of moments. I'd be interested to see what other people thought of the book. There were, there were so many things in this for me that certainly in the first half that were either relatable or sort of not relatable, but relatable. So in there's a moment, it starts with this sort of moment in time that happens to this mother who, uh, who and this is, this is something that happens regularly to most parents when you've got two her, her, one in a pram and one who is you know smaller but quite capable of just running amok and sodding off and so she's in the park and she's got hold of she's got one in a pram and then the, the daughter goes and, and runs off in another direction and the, the mother Audrey sort of you know has to make that decision what am I going to do I can't can't be in two places at once and so she runs off after the daughter and as she when she comes back 
the pram with her son in it has ended up uh, in this sort of pond and an apparent stranger has rescued the pram. The pram hasn't really gone very far into the pond anyway, but they form this friendship. For me, the beginning of the interest for me of this moment uh, and and actually the way that Audrey perceives it and, con- and continues. So you, you get, what I like is that you're drip fed a little bit, if you like, bits and pieces about the character. So you're not spoon fed everything about this character in the first chapter. It becomes discoverable as you go through the story. You learn each little, there's a little snippet here and a little snippet there. So although it builds up in what it does, for me, there's quite a nice pace at the beginning of of discoverability of characters, which I really liked. Um, But some of the moments for me that kind of either made me go, oh yeah, or made me go, really? And not in the way that you would think. So that moment where the the pram goes into the lake and the daughter, I mean, this is something that happens to any parent at any time uh, regularly. I mean, hopefully the pram doesn't end up in the lake for anybody, but you know. Um, And what, what she questions throughout it, Audrey, is she is so sure that, that she'd put the brake on. And and what it tells you, I, I remember thinking, the first, I was like, can you really be sure? Because I'm not sure, as a mother of two, I'm not sure of anything at any moment because I can't remember whether I've packed the swimming kit, whether I've sent them in with their lunch or a box full of cockroaches or, you know, there are moments where you literally can't remember what day it is when she's so sure. But you kind of learn again a little bit more about this character in that she does have, um, she's she's sort of very controlling, very organised, and, and but she has this sort of level of anxiety and she begins to sort of question those things. But anyway, but I think it's interesting to look at that, uh, leaning up, leading up to Mother's Day, those characteristics of, of mothers, mothers who are so sure, they absolutely know they have such a routine that they absolutely know that, that, that they would have done that. Um, and then other parents say, no, I have no idea whether I did that or not. Um, and, but she makes this friendship with this girl, Claire. And this starts off as actually a, a real breath of fresh air for her. She's, she's made this decision to be a stay-at-home mum. She admits freely that she's not a very sociable person anyway. So, she's, so she hasn't sort of gone out and actively looked for other mum friends. But even that in itself can be quite lonely because it becomes one conversation that you continually have. Um, with your mum friends. So it is always nice to have a friend who isn't a parent and that you can talk to about other stuff because you can't help when you're talking to other parents, I think, talking about your kids, talking about this stuff and blah, 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 and that, and that can become very insular. Um, but she doesn't even really have that. She she sort of essentially doesn't have any friends. And so this girl, Claire, turns up. She's younger. She's, you know, very friendly and, and just sort of infiltrates her life a little bit. And at first, there are a few moments where you go, mm, that's a bit, that's a bit much. And obviously, you're aware from the title that there's going to be something going on here. And, but it, but it's kind of, again, it's nicely done as she sort of infiltrates and this stuff happenings. In the meantime, there's other stuff going on that's starting to freak Audrey out. So, and and then sort of a bit further on in the book, it flips. And I love this. And there's there's a bit in the back of the book where it talks, where uh, uh, Penny puts in, I'm assuming it's Penny or the, or the um, editor, puts in some questions for book clubs. And and one of those is about what do you think about the, the switch in the narrative uh, and the change of the point of view. And I love that moment. And we've had that a little bit in... Um, in Wine and Words this season where we had sort of a split decision and um, but there there's this moment where you then get it flips so it's told in the first person from Audrey's point of view and then in the second part you, or in the next bit you then get Claire's point of view and I love this moment because it I, I really like anything that gives you more than one perspective on, on what's going on because you can become easily embroiled in Audrey's world and how she feels and and you can villainize Claire and then you get that kind of flip side which which I think is really interesting so for me I thought this was 
and then it goes on I don't for those of you that don't uh, haven't read it I don't want to kind of ruin it for you but I loved it it was an incredibly enjoyable read um lots of twists and turns characters that you like but don't like they're they're real they have things that you might not under you might not necessarily you know there's there's some sort of realistic attitude to the to their behaviors in that they're not they're not perfect and so even at the beginning i think one of my reservations with audrey was oh gosh, you know, she's one of these perfect parents she's not at all and, and and she doesn't even think she is so there's lots of sort of cracks in in these people so again for me and as i've said this many times before i'm a very character driven person when it comes to books and i really liked the characters and the way that they're fed to you throughout the story i think is lovely really grips you and brings you in so highly recommend it it was great and um as a sort of thriller uh mum story to bring you into uh mother's day i thought it was a really really interesting read and penny's got a variety of other uh, some other books out that you can check out now she also has which i will put into the comments so i will put um a link to penny's website and her newsletter and if you join her newsletter then you have the poten the chance to win various bits and pieces so i'll put that in the comments because that's well worth having a look at um, if you've got any questions about the book or you want to have a chat uh, put in some different bits of comments about what you thought about the book even if it's in if you read it next week and it's a couple of weeks and come back and tell us what you thought um, that's fine if you've had some hungarian wine recently i know uh, one of our members mentioned that uh, ferment was mentioned on pointless this week and it was the first time she'd heard of it and now here i am drinking it so cheers so i am once again going to leave you with a little snippet. Penny gave me permission to record a snippet of her new best friend for you. So I will leave you with that to listen to. And the final thought is don't forget that we do have, for those of you that are in the Midlands area or Solly Hole area, we have our live event on the 7th of April, which is just over two weeks, where we have Penny Bachelor is coming, Adam Wood from last week, and AJ West, which is next week's book, next week's book, which is the Spirit Engineer. Uh, and they are coming to Wine and Words live in real person, actual people, at Fraser's Wine Studio in Solly Hole. And tickets are still available. Again, I'll be posting about that in the in the group anyway. But I'll put a link in. So if you are local and you want to come, there will be transport from Kenilworth to the wine studio and back again. And also from Solihull Station to the wine studio and back again. But you'll have to email me directly to let me know that you're going to be involved in that transport so I can make sure that you've got a space. Uh, you can, or you can DM me on Facebook or whatever. So thank you very much for joining me. Uh, so if you've got any questions or comments about the wine or the book, then pop them in, even if it's, you're watching the replay in a few weeks, that's absolutely fine. So I'm going to leave you with a small snippet from her new best friend by Penny Batchelor. ...with the delicious smell of mushroom wellington cooking alongside roast potatoes in the oven. We're having a special Sunday lunch to celebrate me getting the freelance accountancy work contract, which will start in a month's time. I'm happy to do the cooking today, as it gives me the chance to listen to my kind of music on the radio, and for James to have some one-to-one -one daddy time with Wilfrid and Antonia. I smirk, as I wonder whether once he starts his two-day weekdays looking after them, he'll be as enthusiastic at 7am. I'm steaming the broccoli and carrots when my mobile rings. It's Rob. He skips over the pleasantries and cuts straight to the chase. I've been doing a bit of digging on Clingy Clare. Really? Why? Have you found anything? I'm balancing my phone between my shoulder and cheek to keep my hands free for cooking. The steam leaves a fine mist on my face. I thought there was something very odd about her, the way she turned up when I was visiting you and she wouldn't take a hint to leave. She carried on not taking the hint for a few days afterwards. But I think she's finally got the message now. I think she's just lonely and a bit needy. I felt it was more than that. There's something not quite right about her behaviour. You can be too nice, Audrey. Some people in this world aren't. Her name is Claire Jones, right? Yes. Well, that made it difficult from the start to track her. Handy for her, isn't it, that she's got two very common names? I went through pages and pages on Facebook and Twitter and didn't find anyone that could be her. 
You've been searching for her on the internet. She might have privacy settings or not be on social media. A lot of 20-somethings aren't on Facebook anyway. I couldn't find her anywhere. How can you get to her age without a digital footprint? I also couldn't find any trace of her working at a local business. Where did she do her degree? I'm not sure. Somewhere in London, I think. She definitely said she studied business, but never said where. I'll have a look at unis in London. They're not going to give out her details, though, are they? Confidentiality laws and all that. Aren't you going a bit far? What is it you're trying to find out? Audrey, you're my best friend, and Antonia is my goddaughter. I'm just looking out for you. Something about Claire just doesn't feel right to me. That woman is weird. I don't want her causing you any trouble. What if she's got a background of psychiatric instability? At that, I laugh. That had never occurred to me, so thanks for giving me something extra to worry about. I think you're worrying about nothing there, though. I might be finding her a ning, but I don't think she's mentally ill. And if she is, it doesn't mean she'd cause me any problems. I think she's lonely. She might be lonely, but I still think her behaviour is odd. What's she like with James? Has she spent much time alone with him? I think back to her turning up at the house when I wasn't in. Oh, there was one time when I was with the book group people. She stayed for an hour, James said. Claire told him how I met her when she pulled Wilf's pram out of the pond. But you not told him? No. We've talked about it since, though. I hear Rob take a deep breath, and I can tell he's got something difficult to say. With hindsight, do you think she told him deliberately to discredit you? It crossed my mind that she might have wanted to cause trouble, but I, I don't think so. It's fair to say she must have assumed he already knew. Rob's voice takes on a more serious tone. Do you think she might be after James? That when you first became friends, she liked your family life and now wants to keep in touch with you in order to get him? I laugh. James? He wouldn't cheat on me. I've never worried about that. He wouldn't have an affair with her. He hasn't got the time. It's only me who doesn't think he's a bit boring, because I am too. I'm not saying that he would, and that doesn't stop Claire trying to, does it? Do you know where she lives? No. She lives in a shared house. She said it's not the sort of place you can invite friends to, but didn't tell me the street or area. She doesn't like giving out personal information, does she? No, she doesn't. Look, can I call you back this afternoon, please? I'm in the middle of cooking Sunday lunch. Of course, I've got a date. I'll tell you all about it. You better. The man who moved abroad for a while? Yes. The timer pings, and I turn the oven and hob off when I hear the doorbell. James is with the children in the playroom, so I go to answer it. I don't believe it. The front door opens to reveal Claire. Hi, she says all smiley, her emotions being at a mismatch with mine. Claire. Hello. I'm busy, I'm afraid. I'm cooking. I only open the door a fraction so she can't invite herself in and stay the rest of the day. I was passing again and wanted to talk to you. I'm not usually one for confrontations, but there's a first time for everything. Claire. I need to talk to you too, but not here. Not in front of the children. My hackles are rising quickly and I'm gripped by a sudden feeling that I have to bring this odd friendship to a close right now. James, I'm popping out for five minutes. I've turned the oven and hob off. Won't be long. I wait until I hear an OK in response. I step outside and then pull the door not quite to so I can get back in. Follow me, I say to Claire, marching ahead towards the park at the end of our road. The gates are open, but it's surprisingly quiet for a Sunday. The only living creatures I see are butterflies fluttering around the faded wildflower borders that the council planted to improve its environmental rating and cut back on mowing fees. I stop in a secluded wooded area where no passers-by will hear us. Audrey, I came to say I'm sorry if you think I'm bothering you. I don't mean to, pipes up Claire. But you still do, don't you? Bother me, that is. I specifically asked you not to come round to my house and said to wait for me to call you. I know, but I don't let her carry on, and I'm quite taken aback with my newfound confidence. You've got to stop interfering in my life, Claire. My family comes first, and you're not one of them, OK? I think about what Rob said. Have you been lying to me about something? What is it that you want? Why do you keep showing up when I've asked you not to so many times? 
I just want to be friends, that's all. I'm sorry I've upset you. I, I really am. Ow! I slap my neck instinctively when I feel a sharp prick. Was I stung? Is that a bee that flew away in the corner of my vision or some other biting insect? My EpiPen is in my handbag. My handbag is in the hall at home. Trying not to panic, I search my trouser pockets frantically in the vain hope that the EpiPen will magically appear. Are you after James? Is that it? Do you want my husband? To slip into my shoes? Have my house? My life? It's hard taking the moral high ground when I'm looking over a foot up to my adversary. Claire isn't saying anything. Her mouth is wide open as if she's going to shove a gobstopper into it. I run my hand over my neck, trying to feel if there's a bump there, and try not to panic. I'm not far from the house. This won't take long. James isn't interested in you. He's my husband. Please back off. I'm not... I cut Claire off mid-flow, not wanting to hear any of her excuses. Just stay away. I'm sorry, I don't have time now to carry on being friends, and I have to go back home because I'm about to serve up Sunday lunch. I don't want to upset you, but I need time and space with my family, and you're not in it. I haven't said anything to James, so I don't want to embarrass you any further. My heart starts to beat faster, and a sheen of sweat covers my palms. Are you OK? Claire asks. I think I've been stung. I try to take slow breaths and search again with my fingertips to see if the bee's sting is still in my neck. I'm allergic. My EpiPen. It's in my handbag back at the house. My phone and keys are in there too. My welling panic takes over as I remember ten years ago when I was stung before. I used the EpiPen straight away as per the doctor's orders, but felt faint and wheezy for a while, and it took a day or two for the symptoms to go after I sought medical help. Anaphylactic shock works quickly on me. Sit down, Claire says, although she probably hasn't a clue what to do in this situation. I wipe the perspiration off my brow with the back of my hand, and my top clings to my moist underarms. I can't sit down. I need to go and get my EpiPen. Have you got your mobile on you? I only came out with my keys in my jeans pocket. Really? I think you should sit down. You've gone a funny colour. I have to get home. I can't believe I came out without my handbag. I never do that. Please, find someone with a phone and call James and tell him to run here with my EpiPen. My heart is beating in a frenzy. Is it the sting, panic, or both? My knees start to shake. I flop down on the slightly damp grass, feeling the remnants of early morning rain through the seat of my jeans. I try to take a deep breath, but can't seem to inhale enough oxygen. I look up. Claire is standing there, looking at me, her mouth slightly agape. I try to call out for help when I haven't got a breath to shout. Go, Claire. Find someone. Please. It's urgent. I whisper. She bends down and squeezes my hand. Her grip feels clammy. What's James's mobile number? I can't remember. It's saved into my phone. Just run and find someone and call an ambulance. Tell them to hurry. It's anaphylactic shock. Dizziness overtakes me. I lie down on the grass, curled up in the fetal position as I do to sleep. When James usually spoons me, his warm arms wrapped around my chest, holding me tight for the night. Now, instead of arms, it feels like there's a vice around my chest, slowly squeezing the air out of me. I hold on to the pictures of James, Antonia and Wilfred in my head. They are all that I care about. I must breathe for them. Hold on until the ambulance comes. Part Two Claire I never meant to do this. I never meant for things to go this far. Please believe me, oh God, if you exist, please believe me. I'm frozen, staring at Audrey lying grey-faced on the grass, my brain not taking in what is happening. What's going on? How can people get so ill from a bee sting? I don't know what to do. My brain is befuddled. Then Audrey tells me to go and call James and tell him to bring her EpiPen, whatever that is. 
time seems to slow down to a millisecond, the tableau of horror fixed before my eyes. Go, she says. She needs her handbag, which she left at home in a hurry to accuse me and push me out of her family after she'd welcomed me in with cake, a latte, and a declaration of not knowing how she could ever thank me. I've never seen someone so poorly before. When Audrey mentioned her allergy once in the past, I thought she was hamming it up like rich people do about milk, gluten and wheat, all that jazz about how they're so special that they have to eat differently from everyone else, make a fuss and buy posh food because they'll simply die if they don't. Shit, I think that's actually happening to her. She looks so tiny, vulnerable and childlike on the grass. There's no one around. Audrey obviously likes to bin someone off in private, and she's brought me to a secluded part of the park in the wooded area where kids like to smoke weed and leave used condoms instead of carrying them to the rubbish bin at the park entrance. I must scream and get help. I ought to go and get help. Her lips are turning a pale shade of blue now. My muscles start to respond to my brain's call for action, and I bend down, take Audrey's outstretched fingers and squeeze them. They're still warm. Don't worry, I'll get help. I'll get an ambulance, I say to reassure her, and I mean it. I turn on my heels and run. What Audrey can't see is that I'm running in the opposite direction from the main path. You see, I, I need a second to think about what to do. Audrey has a kind heart. I like her. She's cosseted, yes, but that's what you get from being born middle class and never having to want for anything. When I think this, I feel a pang of sympathy for her, as I remember the difficulties she's been through being born with restricted growth. I've seen with my own eyes the way that some people judge her, stare, mutter to each other when she's walked past. Yet she's unfairly got what I want, and I want it so badly. No, I never meant it to go this far. But I didn't sting her, did I? I didn't tell her to go out without her EpiPen and leave her mobile phone at home. You're not my family, she said to me. We've been friends. I'm not an animal. I need to get help for her. I can't leave her on the damp grass, struggling to breathe. I'm deeper in the wooded area now. The tree's canopy shielding me from the clouded sun and any prying eyes. I touch my back jeans pocket and feel the familiar hard, thin rectangle of my knock-off pay-as-you-go smartphone tucked in there. In my panic I'd forgotten that. Although I hadn't bought a handbag on my walk over to Audrey's house, I, I have my phone with me. My shaking fingers dial the wrong access code. I get it right on the third clumsy attempt and then jab the nine button. Once. Twice. I'm about to press it the third time, when I stop. A picture of what I have to lose comes into my head. Can't happen a second time. But am I really prepared to do what it takes to stop it? My head bypasses my heart and decides to run the show. My hands are like robots obeying instructions, working to the rhythm of the blood pounding in my veins. I switch the phone off. About five metres away, I bury it under some stones and bracken, then count to fifty, slowly. Mm -hmm.